Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining uh, today's session. We are allowing all of the participants to join the room, so thank you very much for waiting. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining today's session. I think when we can start. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce, the EU China Business Association, the EU SME Center, Euro Chamber, and the China IPSME Help Desk, we would like to warmly welcome you to our webinar focused on knowing your Chinese partner. During this workshop, experts will explain how to prepare yourself for dealing with China and how to get more, how to get to know more about your Chinese partner. One of the main challenges now for SMEs doing business with China is the fact that we still cannot go to China due to the COVID-19 pandemic still going on in the world. Because of this, knowing your Chinese partner has become more difficult now because it is less easy to build up your relationship with your Chinese partner as you can only meet digitally. However, this does not prevent you from doing successful businesses, and there are still a lot of issues that you need to go through before starting to do business with your partner. This will be explained by Mr. Ricardo Benussi, Head of European Business Development at Design Shira and Associates. An important other part for being successful is that companies should have an IP strategy when you're dealing with China. And this point will also be dealt with today by an expert from the USME Help Desk, Mr. Jim Stoltman. In 2019 and 2020, China acceded to United States in patent filings and is gaining tremendous ground also as a leader in setting global standards. Huawei was the top international patent applicant last year. Speaking a few words about EU-China trade and investment relations, according to a recent survey of European companies in China, European companies state that they continue to see China as a top or top three destination for present and future investments. In 2020, China became the biggest, the EU's biggest trading partner, overtaking the US. Foreign investments in China have increased by 6.2%. China overtook the US and gained, regained the title of the world's top destination for FDI and will also be one of the main drivers of the world's growth this year. According to the IMF, Chinese growth will be at 8.2% this year, which is the highest in 10 years. So China is really a market which should not be ignored, but companies should go well prepared. Before we go to the next speaker, I would like to mention a few words about the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce. So our chamber was founded by the largest investors from Belgium and China, such as Achias, Achfa, Bekar, Barco, Picanol, Yumicor, and so on. So our aim is to help Belgian companies expand in China and to assist Chinese companies expand in Belgium. We also provide a weekly China business newsletter to keep you up to date on China's economy and trade and organize webinars on how to and how not to do business. We also give expert advice and normally we receive many Chinese delegations, but due to the pandemic, this cannot happen. So we work digitally and we hope second half of this year, this could start again. Our actions are organized in close cooperation with our structural partner, Flanders Investment and Trade. And we are also active on the European level, as we are also in charge of the EU-China Business Association, which is the association of bilateral China business associations in the EU, aiming at promoting the economic and trade relations between the EU and China. I like to end here and would like to mention that we are at your disposal 
For any further information, and we also welcome you for our online talk on how we can further assist you with your business with China. I also like to mention a practical point that you can send questions through the Q&A function. The questions will be dealt with during the Q&A. I would now like to give the floor to Ms. Laura Velasco, project manager at the USME Center. Laura, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wen. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to all the participants today. And also thank you very much to the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce, the China IPSME Help Desk, but also uh, Di Zanzira, which is bringing today's expert to the table. A um, few words about the EUSME Center before we start this webinar, uh, for those who haven't heard about us. Uh, the USME Center is a European Union initiative that started in 2010 with the aim of helping uh, European businesses getting ready to do business with China. We are currently on the first, first uh, phase of the project running until March 2022. Um, uh, we are an official member of Enterprise Europe Network and uh, we partner in Europe and in China with uh, around almost uh, 300 uh, business associations uh, chambers of commerce, um, government agencies, and other uh, type of supporting uh, associations in order to reach to uh, the USMEs we want to help. We have uh, local offices in Beijing, and the project that is coming from the European Commission is actually implemented uh, by the uh, five uh, organizations that you can see at the bottom of this slide. In terms of the services, we provide four main services. Uh, the first of them is called the Knowledge Center. Uh, in our, on our website, you can actually find uh, an online library with around 200 market reports. Some of them are really focused uh, on specific sectors, such as, for example, green tech, artificial intelligence, or the food and beverage industry. But some others are more transversal, and today's topic is an example of it, knowing your Chinese partner. Also, we touch other uh, interesting topics such as uh, digital marketing or uh, cross-border economy. The second service, it's uh, called the self-diagnosis tool. This is a new service that the ESME Center uh, has started rendering a few weeks ago, actually. Uh, it's about um, an online um, quiz, or actually five uh, online quizzes that helps the assessor, the person, to understand the level of readiness towards the Chinese market. There is a general quiz and then four specific ones focused on uh, products, on funding, and HR and business development. Uh, the third service, or within the advice center as well, we have a uh, hot desk called Ask the Expert, where actually uh, uh, companies uh, can ask questions about anything related to China business. Um, normally, our experts will reply to your questions within two or three or 14 days. And uh, here you can ask anything related to business development, HR, uh, regulation, um, taxation, well, you name it, you have it in there. Uh, the third service is the training center. Uh, here we try to plug the, uh, the knowledge and skill gaps of SMEs in order to make them fully ready to enter the Chinese market. And today's uh, webinar is a very good example of it. Uh, we collaborate with a European associations, such as today, the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce, in order to organize and lecture this kind of training. And last but not least, we have an advocacy platform um, trying to give voice to the concerns and the mm, willing of the European businesses that are looking into the Chinese market. Uh, thanks to the support of the European Chamber of Commerce in China, we have an interchamber working group where we provide information and we uh, keep companies updated on the economic and social change, changes happening in China. Um, a little bit of our upcoming events for those interested. Uh, in the coming weeks, uh, at the beginning of June, we are having a few events related to the water sector as we are participating in Aquatech China. Uh, those events are related to digitalization, circular economy, and uh, other uh, water-related matters. Uh, we are also going to be lecturing an event on the updated policy in the cosmetic sector. And a little bit later in June, uh, we are going to be talking about the, the China dairy sector and uh, at the end of the month about indirect sales and business partners in China, which is a very good continuation of what we are talking today. Uh, in terms of uh, physical events, we are participating in uh, Aquatech China and also in China International Industry Fair that is going to take place in September 2021. 
um, in terms of activities or actions, we are organizing a training session or a webinar uh, in October this year, later on, with another partner of us, uh, in order to share experience of companies that have successfully sold their products uh, into China during the COVID. For this, we are looking into five different uh, SMEs coming from different uh, sectors that can actually share their experience and how they successfully managed to do so. If you are interested, you can send an email um, to me. Uh, my email address is here in this, on the slide. And uh, just giving us some information about your company, about your activities, and also explain a little bit how, how you managed to, to sell and to survive during, during the pandemic, thanks to the, the support or, or the internationalization to, into China. And last information I would like to share today is that in regards to the China International Industry Fair, we are actually uh, collaborating in the organization of a European pavilion. And for that, we are going to be supporting around 40 European SMEs uh, that related to the clean technologies, energy saving or industrial cleaning uh, in order to exhibit there. Um, we are targeting both companies that are already operating in China or those that actually haven't started uh, selling in there. Um, for this purpose, we are also working very closely with embassies and consulates in order to support, uh, physically support uh, the presentation of the company during the event. Uh, here you can see how the pavilion uh, has been designed and also additional information on the, the shape of the boots that we are designing as well. There is a space for conferencing and also for B2B meetings. Uh, Gwen just already mentioned it, but uh, just uh, technically tell a reminder, um, for any question uh, you, that you would like to raise, do not wait until the end of the webinar, just bring them into the Q&A button that you will find uh, in the panel in Zoom. Uh, if you want to ask any question related to the organization, whether the slides will be distributed, whether the event will be recorded and afterwards uh, updated, please use the chat. Uh, this way we, we can separate both, both actions and, and Ricardo and both team can actually follow on this uh, more efficiently. And now today about our first speaker, as uh, Wen said, we have two. The first of them is Ricardo Benusi, is the head of European Business Development. Um, Ricardo is actually representing Vivancia uh, and Associates in Europe, but before he was actually uh, um, uh, responsible of the International Business Advisory Team uh, in the Shanghai area. Uh, he has a China IPLO background and his fields of expertise include Asia business strategy uh, with a special focus of manufacturing, heavy machinery, and food and beverage. Um, only one last thing before I leave the floor to Ricardo, we are gonna be uh, having a small coffee break of five minutes. Uh, Ricardo will be actually um, uh, referring to that afterwards. Thank you very much and enjoy the webinar today. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Gwen, for the introduction. And thank you, everybody, at the wonderful team of the EU SME Center that has been doing such a wonderful job over the years, since at least 2010, uh, when I first uh, uh, started to go to, uh, to Beijing and Shanghai uh, after the first experiences in 2005. It is a pleasure to talk to you this morning uh, and be able to bring something to the floor in terms of uh, analysis of who your partner is. Just a couple of uh, first um, hand instructions or introductions of uh, who our company, what our company does and who we are and a little bit about, about myself so you can have some information in the background uh, just to know who you are talking to or who is doing that. Ricardo, one yeah. minute before I interrupt you, uh, can you change the presentation mode? Because now we can Absolutely. see- it's a little bit small. I'm ah, perfect. There you Thank go. Thank you very much. It's great. Everything works during the test. And then when you're live, it's the other way around. Thank you for reminding me. So uh, Business Year and Associates has been uh, since 1992 supporting small and medium enterprises in their internationalization uh, towards the Asian market. We are essentially a pan-Asian present uh, FDI company, is a consulting firm that supports you uh, with everything that goes from legal to tax, accounting, HR, and uh, other strategizing um, services that can be very beneficial for your future growth in 
Asia. About myself, I have a um, uh, legal background, as, uh, as already said by Laura. I've been uh, um, for seven years in Beijing and I'm in Shanghai, sorry, and to support companies that have, of course, the intentions of uh, setting up or understanding or navigating the opportunities in the Chinese market first. And then now, and now that, that I moved to Germany, uh, July last year, I'm overlooking the uh, European market to help the companies that are trying to go to Asia in general, where we have offices to uh, uh, thrive. Um, at this point, I would like to remind that 40% more or less of our client base is European based. So I would be very, very happy to meet you or have offline conversations with you in your same time zone uh, in order to facilitate your understanding or more conversation about this fascinating mega region that is Asia, especially China. Now you, uh, I, I will, I will remove my camera so you don't have too much uh, visual stimulation, and uh, then uh, invite you to follow with me the agenda that we have set for you today. I remind you that uh, the questions can be asked, as Laura said before, in the chat box, in the Q and A box, actually, not the chat box, and that you will receive a ver version of this in your mail after the presentation. And that you can sit back because of this and it's also going to be recorded so no worries and take your time because you have signed up for a two hour webinar after all. <laughs> so without uh, wasting too much of your time, let me introduce the headers of this uh, presentation today. As Laura said, it is about your partner so getting to know your partner, the do's and don'ts. And let's see the first things that we apparently feel that are important for you to get a head start from. So getting ready before getting comfortable is uh, what I chose to use as a title for you because sometimes you get excited about the prospect of doing business in China. And it is uh, very, very uh, important to get an understanding of what you want actually from that market before you get uh, comfortable in the notion of addressing one specific type of partner. So under this header, we will be talking about what you have to give, what you want to uh, from, uh, from the Chinese market, and then getting on staying on the same page, which means that you should have a good process of collecting information informally before you do it formally, and we'll see when. And this is exactly when. So first fork in the road would be a background check or a full-blown due diligence. I will help you navigate through the definitions of these and see which one is more appropriate and to your and suitable to your needs and what you can expect to receive in return from these efforts. Lastly, the key information you will need to make the decision to going onwards in your venture into China. The second header is the understanding of records in China. China, as, a, as I will say later, has a very long tradition in uh, certificates, permits, rubber stamps, etc. And it is, however, cutting a lot of red tape. And it is also improving, therefore, the access to information, although most of it is still in Chinese. But the websites are increasingly better in at the government level in English. So it is there's no excuse for not being able to at least navigate the main websites that are conducive to understanding who you have in front of you as a partner. Therefore, I will be talking about the business license for those who have not yet seen one, why it's important to know where to find some particular information on these and to control, to check whether the information that you are given is actually true. What the company chops are, or rubber stamps are also called, and why they're so but they're particularly important when dealing with Chinese companies or any kind of individual. Permits and licenses, uh, we will analyze which ones could be, based on your model, the ones that you need to take a closer look on, a look at, or actually ask for, ask a copy of. Premises and land will quickly hover over because not all of the investments include or entail having activities on the ground or uh, having to set up a manufacturing entity. And then finally, in this the second chapter of the corporate social credit system, the CSCS, uh, infamous or famous. And let's see why it has something to do with today's topic. At that point, I hope to have hit a certain um, mark or 45 minutes more or less, and you will be able to enjoy your coffee break for five minutes. And then we'll all gather back for number three, where we'll talk about there's nothing like being on site. So the importance 
or the advantages or the information, the wealth of information you can gather when you are on site or somebody is for you on site. Lastly, getting dirty is better than getting nowhere. So it is uh, absolutely important important to get things done on the ground and make things work and proceed and action some processes and get things done instead of just being afraid of uh, this and that potential disruption to your project. So which are the frequent do's and don'ts? What is fraud and what prevention you can, you can put in place against fraud, whether internal or external? and scams, a couple of examples, and how you can resort to or where to resort to in case of scams. So as I said, getting ready before getting comfortable. And the first headline is understanding what you want and if you have alternatives. Now, I would like to do some play and uh, some serious play to see whether you find yourself on the following mind map that you'll see in a couple of seconds, which may of course change over time. This mind map can be handy for you to see whether your business model is on the track, on the track that you expected, or could be open or can open up to other scenarios that you probably did not contemplate. In fact, giving you alternatives. So regardless how you want to interact with China, hands-on with a manufacturing plant or a completely hands-off approach in a cross-border way, for example, you will need to be exposed to people, to government documents, to procedures, and this is when it comes in handy to know how to deal with partners in China. So this was my segue into the mind map that I was talking of, telling you about. So we, we like to use this um, tree, let's say, to see whether an investor has clarity on where he wants to go because there might some, sometimes be a disalignment of what the company really wants to achieve in terms of uh, uh, success or in terms of development of their current business. And the, the only way to understand this is to, to sit down with uh, somebody who is already there and has been doing this job of supporting companies or somebody who is very knowledgeable and can guide the decision making process of the entity. So let's suppose that we start from a very basic question. Do you need staff in China? So usually if the answer is no, then the company needs to issue, the, the next question would be whether the company needs to issue China tax invoices, the famous fa piao, to its customers. If the answer is no, then banking, whether if the banking, uh, there's banking difficulties when paying suppliers and or collecting payments from customers? What is the answer to that? If it's no, the company does not need to, or you do not need to register a subsidiary in China. And there's different ways to define subsidiary as some of you may know. You at this point may choose to do business with China, not directly in China, through a cross-border transactional model, which may be the, exactly the same that you're doing right now or not. If uh, your company needs staff, in fact, on the ground, but the company doesn't sp spend uh, too much time in China to trigger permanent establishment, then the staff and the staff are performing economic uh, activity in China, then there is no need to register a subsidiary in China. Because if the company, if the people stay in China for more than half a year or for more than an aggregate of half a year for the same type of project, even with different people for the same type of pro project, you will trigger permanent establishment, which will then require you to make a decision whether to leave or to establish a, a presence. For all other circumstances where everything is answered with a yes question, then you'll have to need to register a subsidiary in China. And in this, I don't want to go into too much detail because it's not the, the core of this matter today, but you'll be able to choose based on the conditions that you are looking at for a joint venture, and I put it in quotes because it is now not formally called joint venture any longer, but we can still talk about it as a joint venture or a representative office. And if you need a subsidiary, a fully wholly owned limited company in China, then you'll have to choose whether you'll have to have a manufacturing entity, a trading company, or a service, Wufi or service FIE, as they call it, foreign invested enterprise. And this is a mind map that you can keep handy to answer some questions for yourself later. It is important to, to understand, very important to understand what you offer, what you have, and what you're looking for. An overarching 
seminar like today's, as you have already understood, it covers potential new investors, it covers potential uh, new um, people who are approaching the market for the second or third time, or those who are actually already in China cannot come back to China and they want to expand their market, or they're increasing the type of services or goods that they already have ready for the Chinese market, or they need more products from China. Inevitably, I'll have to remain a bit generic in some of the slides and some of the concepts, but happy to go into detail with you offline. So what you have to offer or what you want to search for is paramount. It's very important. You have to qualify these. Are, they, are these goods? What kind of goods are they? What do they qualify for? And you will see a bit later. Uh, are they services that you're offering? Or are they in the education industry? Are they in the medical service industry? Or is it just plain know-how? What is it that one of your employees brings to the market if you send him an engineer or um, a designer or an architect or a, a healthcare expert to China for a specific amount of time for a specific project? What is the protection that you have to give to this kind of know-how? But the IP will be discussed later by Jim. Understanding if, to whom, and how you can offer these goods, services, and know-how is equally important. And why do I make a statement that is hard? Because you don't know at this point whether for whatever service or goods or know-how you want to cater, look for, or do both, you actually only need one type of partnership. Whether maybe it's just a one-off or maybe it's a greatly structured joint venture or maybe even a cooperation with a local government. To be able to narrow in and zoom into potentially understanding better how you need to uh, deliver or you want to deliver these services, goods, or know-how, and to whom, and if at all, we have come up with a diagram that uh, breaks down the what, the if, the to, from, from home, home, and how. So if we're talking about the what, are your goods or services defined in China as they are in your home country? I'm thinking about the typical examples of services, sometimes uh, therapeutical services or uh, psych psychotherapy services are considered a normal service in our countries, but maybe in China they're closer to healthcare and therefore not accessible as such for an, by an investor and they have to use a another domestic entity as a partner who has that specific license that is only for domestic entities. Or for example, food supplements. What qualifies for a food supplement in Germany may not qualify for the same in China or the other way around. Even water bottle, uh, labels of uh, bottled water may be mineral water in Italy or uh, in Belgium, but may be natural or demineralized water in other countries, especially in China or chocolate, etc. for that matter. Medical devices, for example, how invasive is your medical device considered in face of the Chinese law and therefore, do you need to apply for a special license at the SDA or do you need to look for a partner who can import them or help you manufacture them? When we talk about the if, we should think about whether your goods or services are strongly required. If they're actually allowed, restricted or prohibited, please note the escalating progression, or maybe too expensive to source from China. So when you're compiling your matrix with the answers to these questions, you'll be able, and we'll see in a couple of slides, to see whether you are ready for the market, if you need to uh, prepare better, or actually you cannot ac access the market at all because your product is, or service is just not allowed at the moment. When looking at the to or from whom, what consumers or supply base are you aiming at? Is it a B2B investment? Is it normal B2C or even B2 government? Have you been interacting with the right people? Do you know exactly how to get to them? Are you using institutional channels or just hearsay? All of these things have to be compiled, understood, because time, your time is your money. And about the how. How are you going to do this? How are you going to sell or search your good services and know-how? Via a partner's network? Are you going to do it uh, online uh, when you have time or through a person that apparently knows Chinese or has been there for a while? Or are you going straight for retail or just thinking about wholesale and you don't want to get 
involved in retail, or maybe a combination of these, even including e-commerce. So in order to understand this, you might, in order to put all the, let's say, ducks in the row and understand what kind of investment is possible and possible at this moment, don't worry, the slides are coming, you can consider a business intelligence uh, analysis. So while a market access study provides a multiple points of view for an investor, one of them, the one in red, might focus on finding a strategic partner. That's what we're talking about today. In fact, I highlight that any market analysis that includes shortlisting of potential buyers or suppliers or target companies for acquisition or partners in manufacturing or pharmaceutical developers of your uh, uh, prescription-based uh, pharma or your R&D or even your, the professionals for you will need to go through the considerable work to vet this or that company. So the, while the business intelligence study or the market access memo will help you answer the questions that we just saw, the business matchmaking or let's say the distributor or suppliers um, sh shortlisting will help you to find them. But that's just one part of the iceberg, the tip. In fact, how do you meet or look for or encounter your next partner, your future partner? There's different ways. Maybe in a, from a more systematic search, you'll have the following uh, diagram, or maybe just incidentally, you'll have the following diagram. Maybe you'll just have a couple of these, or maybe all four or more. Generally speaking, the first is the most reassuring one because it is a short list that comes after an analysis that is supposedly based on valid criteria and on qualified sources. But it also can be the source of fraud. It can be a source of malicious intent. And we'll see more of that later. The second in line, let's say, is a database. You find partners on database. But how did those companies or individuals, mostly companies, get on those database? Did they pay? Did they, were they scrutinized? Did they go through a verification system? And if so, when was it done? Very important before you start investing your time talking to a potential partner. Have you met them or will you meet them at trade fairs? Trade fairs usually seem to qualify for a very approved basis environment. It is true. Most of the trade fairs you have heard of and where other institutions that like the European ones that you've heard in the introduction are present are very qualified. But there's just so much that the organizers can do because there are ways where fake companies, and we'll see about those later, or even paper tiger companies can show up, attract your interest, get your curiosity and attention, but then reveal themselves for what they aren't. Or maybe you have heard or met or is trying to do business with a partner that is a friend of a friend of another friend, or maybe the cousin of a friend or a supplier. And these are the most dangerous because you have no way to qualify or to analyze and to verify the origin or the good standing of this company unless you go through the typical analysis tools that are available out there that we'll talk about in depth today. So let's back up a little bit mentally and understand why are we actually interested in doing business in China? I will not repeat why, uh, if and to whom, as I said before, but if we think about a local partner in the general imaginary concept especially uh, those who have been dealing with China or read about doing business in China from the 1980s and onwards, joint venture partner was the mantra. If I access China, I need a partner. That is true and is also not true. There's many layers of how you can sort this out. But usually the reason why you choose a local partner is because the partner has a large or not large, but he has a distribution network, which you don't have. He is a vendor, he is a supplier, he has relationships on the ground, and therefore government contacts, which can speed up processes that you have in mind or you need to cover. And as a foreign investor, you're bringing in know-how, technology, hardware, people, and that's know-how, right? Or uh, any other contribution to the matrix, which can then create 
the product or the service that you want to deploy in China. Definitely also another advantage is that you can leverage on local talent. China has probably the highest and best qualification of, or, or let's say resource, human resource skill set in, in Asia uh, and also among other uh, elements that make it such a unique place to invest and uh, look for talent and retain that talent. So this could be also another reason why you want to have a local partner and use or let's say um, co-use their resources. The Chinese market is also a very volatile market and it's a great way to get access to local tenders and also, as I said before, to access local talent that may enrich and speed and uh, speed up and accelerate your investment into China. I mentioned that you might run into companies, if you, especially if you're very new to the approach to uh, partners in China, that are not necessarily the value that they, they say they are. So however you might run into, whoever you might run into, you, you are going into a jungle of unknowns before you can spot your trusted partner. And this is why you need to collect information informally or formally from the partner or from people around that supposed partner to, to avoid fake companies or shell companies, which is a company without assets or active business, or even parasite companies, these which are potential partner companies which may, may cling, stick heavily, rely on local connections with government. And we'll see what local government connections means later in the positive and the negative. Other companies you might recognize and want to avoid are opportunistic companies. What are these? These have good intentions, and we, we have met many of these uh, throughout the years, but are overly optimistic, and they're just shooting too high, and they're overly optimistic about their hardware, about their people, about their premises, about their relations, and this is just not going to fly. So when planning and doing so, you should also entertain the idea of understanding that they may cut corners and they may be operating below the radar where and if possible. And you don't want that, especially if you're a first comer to China. Finally, a paper tiger. What is this a romantic concept of a paper tiger? Uh, is, uh, this company basically is another one to avoid, another way of saying that these companies avoid um, to reveal themselves for what they really are. They pretend that they are the leader in their sector, that they have extreme uh, great um, reputation, but in fact, they are as fragile as a paper tiger, which exposed to fire will definitely vanish very quickly. It's the second point of this header, getting and staying on the same page. What do I want to say? here? And if you are just starting the conversation with uh, who looks to be your next partner, it is very important to start emphasizing what you absolutely want to do from day one. Why am I being so, and why am I insisting on this so much? Because in our world, in our business approach and um, principles, we are quite clear from the start from what, what we want. And then we don't need to go back and back on the goal, the end goal. Whereas in other countries, and for example, in China, you need to reiterate this uh, very, very often because of language issues, because of uh, the real technical aspects, uh, understanding of your project, and just because maybe they are taking you for the, the, the so-called ride. So if, there's a, if there is a, um, a separation between your real intention and the actions that you're seeing put in place, it's a big red flag. However, collecting information, as I said, is very important. It's fundamental. And you should try to communicate as much as possible with a partner. It is true but also through authorized translators or firms that are specialized in this, because they may, first of all, catch flags that you are not aware of or that you don't think that are important at that time, but also so that you don't get excessively close to a partner from which then it is hard to discern whether they're using you or they're just uh, not on the ball or they're not actually delivering or able to. What else can you do? You can collect clarity on the intentions. I just said this before opening this slide. You must stress test the intentions regularly and almost fastidiously. You must stress test the intentions. I said this three times. I'm already pretty annoying, right? But you will remember this because I stress tested the intention fourth time. So the Chinese may enjoy or may not enjoy this, but if they 
disappear, then it was not meant to be. And you just put in practice a very simple and convenient methodology to verify if they are serious or not. The third element of this header is the first fork in the road, pun intended. A background check or a full-blown due diligence. So during my past few years in our Shanghai office, it happened quite frequently that a foreign investor would use the word due diligence, but actually needed a company credit check and nothing more. So they would come to me or email and say, Ricardo, we have a, a wonderful potential investment. We are looking at uh, cooperating with seven companies in the research industry because we do microscopes and we want to deliver and cater to the best universities and our microscopes are the best. We want a big uh, due diligence on all these seven. And we were obviously happy to help, but due diligence, as we'll see later in the formal connotation and definition is a big undertaking. So after talking very few minutes with the lead and then became a client, they revealed that actually what they need, you can achieve through a background check. So that's why I will try to describe what a background check is, so you can get your jargon correct, and a due diligence or a formal due diligence, and for what purpose you would use one or the other, and at what stage. So we make all this this fork in the road is, is, uh, is a very interesting one because a fork in the road usually is seen as a A or B choice and you cannot come back. But with all jokes aside, if you go for a background check and then decide to nonetheless go for a full legal and financial due diligence on a company, you can still do this, obviously. It's just catering to different needs based on where you are in your project with China. Here we are at the analysis whether you should, whether a background check works for you or a full-blown due diligence works for you. I have tried to keep the same structure. Uh, hopefully that this is clear enough. Let's see if we can make this work. So the background check essentially offers publicly available but limited data. I don't want to expand too much on why I said limited data because that will be explained a little bit later, but just so you know, the main differences at this moment. Between the background check and the formal due diligence, there's one non-traditional judgment care process that you can put in place. This is informal. These are informal inquiries and investigations on the ground. I said informal inquiries and the perils of, why did I say this? Because we'll see in a second, the investigations you have in mind may be illegal in China. Think about it, especially when you're dealing with companies that are SOEs or it involves talking or investigating over an official or even asking about the reputation of a company. And because the use of online data or personal information, especially recently, if you have been following that, that type of news in China, is ever more sensitive in China. Also, Chinese authorities, if you have been dealing with them over the years, you might have learned this, have a very flexible definition of what is public and private suddenly, and may even be considered a state secret when you least expect it. And this could, I can guarantee, easily get in your way and question your, uh, your undertaking very, very quickly. But more to this non-traditional judgment care, two things. One, the definition I gave it. Non-traditional, that means it is not on paper, it's not in a textbook, but it's actually used. And judgment care is another way of saying due diligence. Due diligence is not necessarily only a corporate term or corporate law term and connected to MAs. No, it is the exercise of necessary care or good judgment when doing any kind of undertaking where your resources are at stake. So what else can you do during this non-traditional judgment care phase? and we'll see later when this applies. You can check uh, media reports. You can speak with companies that are provided, uh, the company's name that are provided by the potential partner, so references. You can talk to the affiliate companies of the potential partner, their customers, their suppliers. You can even interact with their competitors or even their employees and neighboring companies, physically neighboring companies. And also, 
And that's what usually most people do is go to industry and trade associations to have a chat about the potential partner. So all of these things you can keep doing from the very start to the very end, see if there's any changes, but the perils of, and this is why I wrote it, is that keep an eye on what your investigations, as formal as they are, can trigger. The Chinese community, when it is very tightly knit, and if they sense that there's too much questioning going on, they may um, fly or fight. So keep this in mind. The next is the definition of uh, formal due diligence. So it is the evaluation of a prospective business decision by getting information about the financial legal operation and reputation of another party. This is the broad definition that we can give. This is not rocket science. Everybody uh, has heard this at least once in their life. Generally speaking, a formal and a deep financial and legal due diligence would be more than appropriate in those industries where the investments are clearly very high. Think about the very high investment in industries. What could they be? Renewable energy, green technology, uh, utilities, um, acquisition of uh, local entities that have access to mineral, uh, to mineral um, uh, mining, or maybe even procurement with several lever levels of government or many provinces. So yes, the due diligence, uh, when it's done in a very deep and formal way, it can take time, but it's also very expensive, but it's worthwhile because that is going to look very small as a cost compared to the potential gains. However, the beauty of due diligence is that there's a formal, uh, this, for, this formal kind of due diligence is that even a small and medium enterprise may need the same tool and will be able to use the same tool and benefit in the same way and probably even faster than an MNC can move. So formal due diligence or legal financial due diligence doesn't mean MNC. It means a tool for everybody, whether deep or, uh, or more superficial DD, to reach clarity on who you are going to partner with. But again, it depends on what stage you are. Not all the partners that you encounter or meet or the, the business cards that you're handed deserve a business uh, a full due diligence because it is uh, sort of a deep under undertaking and we'll see later why. I, I'm coming with some examples now. The quieter approach, this is what I dubbed the background check again, just to change the vocabulary a little bit. So where do I get the information? If I need what the background check can give me. And we'll see that in a second. I can use the state administration for market regulatory or regulation portal, which by the way, has replaced since 2018, the famous SAIC, State Administration for Industry and Commerce. Where else can I get the information that a background check could give me? Business credit reports that maybe agents or firms prepare from Chinese into English publicly traded companies, stock exchange sites, so if it's a publicly listed company, trade associations database, which may be or not outdated, but remember what I told you before about the pyramid, and the import-export records at uh, customs or at other institutions. So by running a background check, one would usually obtain a set of basic and minimum information, such as the full company name, its registered address, the name of the legal representative, the registered capital, and the unified social credit code. And we'll see later what it is, how to read it, where to find it. And you can compare this with um, what you might find on the business license picture that the potential partner might have sent you over WeChat. So other elements discoverable or, uh, are the date of effective establishment, the type of company, whether it's a joint venture, a WUFI, a representative office, we'll see that later. The full business scope, which speaks out what the company can actually do, who is the management, whether the company has been registered or moved to another province or is not existent anymore or temporarily suspended. And if finally the company uh, is or not in the blacklist, which in China uh, translates into abnormal list. So here's a screenshot of the National Enterprise Credit Information Publicity System. It's a bit of a mouthful, but that's uh, you're, you'll get used to this if you're not already. And in this form, you can search the company by this famous um, 
a code that is the unified social credit code and it will give you a sort of um, introduction to the information that i just listed for you and you can also access the blacklist uh, or abnormal lists later as as well i'll tell you later what else do you get this is a screenshot of an actual report that i have uh, and we created for a client and it, it, i have uh, obviously uh, covered the sensitive information, but you would see it in English, you would see it very clearly, and you would see it in condensed in a report that you can obtain relatively fast, and we'll see later how fast. What else can you see? Some financials with some uh, caveats, some ex exceptions, and we'll see what these exceptions are. But if you are a CFO or just a, a very savvy GM, you would be able to see very quickly whether these financials are making sense or not. Examples about the louder approach. So if the quieter was the biz, the background check, the louder approach is the due diligence. And why do I say louder approach? Because this requires, the due diligence requires eight times out of 10, the consent of the target company. Otherwise, it's just plain sailing in obscurity and you don't know whether this is going to qualify as a intimidate, intimidation or if the partner will be scared. Uh, to see that you're doing this, or maybe they will sue you because you didn't give them a heads up. However, let's keep it simple. Where do I get the information for a due diligence? You first need to seek the agreement to allow for on-site visits at the company, at the car, at tar target company or multiple companies. So you have to get permission. You should engage with a firm or people who are qualified, at least in the financial aspects of understanding a company and the legal aspects of doing the same. There will be off online documents for sure that you can collect, but also offline documents. So those that are hidden, let's say, or those that are not necessarily to be uploaded, and those can only be found on premise. Assets are also something that you can get information from. You can uh, go with a valuation team uh, if that's one of the concerns. Staff interviews and internal controls did, and deductions. It's not, there's nothing to do with accounting, but you can deduce you can understand, you can, based on your experience, that means on the professional's experience, what is going on in the company by just simply interviewing them in a strategic manner and checking their internal controls. More about this later. And what do I get? I'm not asking you to get too close to the computer because I am actually zooming this in. I've condensed this so that you wouldn't get distracted too soon about this. So this is the typical breakdown of what a financial and legal DD report contains, a document which is usually in the excess of hundreds of pages and includes, I won't go through them one by one, but some of them I need to, includes the basic information that we've discussed earlier, the capital contribution at the moment, how the business model looks like, of course, certificates and establishment and amendments, et cetera, and down all the way to the financial review results. So it is not uncommon to find Chinese companies using multiple sets of books intended for multiple purposes. For example, one is for the tax bureau, one is for senior executives, and the other is for stakeholders and uh, other type of investors, maybe. Obviously, this malpractice, because it is a malpractice to have multiple sets of books, uh, is uh, that there, uh, there and that is uh, why due diligence should fiercely aim to let these financial issues emerge. So I highlight the capital contribution in yellow as well because it represents the amount of registered capital. We also know it as working capital, as we say. On the business license, it is shown. And it should be therefore important to satisfy your potential interest in this company. Why? Because it gives you understanding whether this company that you're going to deal with or merge with will actually be able to cover his or your business operations needs with that money, depending on whether he will be a partner or a joint venture partner. Unlike listed companies in China, those that are not the audit reports in financial statements or rarely shared at the initial stage of a partnership conversation, but when required, they can be downloaded from the SAMR platforms. If, however, these cannot be downloaded and the company that you're talking to has not been or you want to talk to has not been audited this is a red flag because the company may not be willing or is intentionally not displaying its financials this is very important to understand 
So, so there is another aspect to keep in mind, and which is that uh, since 2014, from when several changes to the corporate uh, law uh, or the FDI law uh, occurred, the annual inspection became an annual report. This means that the ASAMR leaves the responsibility now of the authenticity and the lawfulness of the company's financial statements with the management of the company. So when they submit them the S to the SMR for the annual report, they have to submit them knowing that they, the SAMR is trusting them in their, in their, in their uh, discipline or in their, in their correctness, but it's a risk. But why do I say this? Because many, uh, several times in requests for background checks, we always told the, the, the clients that we can get us a lot of information, corporate information, but not necessarily the one that is related to the annual audits. Because there's, as I just said, after 2014, there's no um, obligation to file the, uh, to, to receive annual inspections and therefore to reflect the, the, the results of these in the, um, in the reports. So therefore in the public database. Let me see, I'm checking also some of your questions going on, but I don't want to interrupt the flow. So yes, maybe later we can, if you feel the need, Laura or, or Jim to interrupt me quickly and uh, raise a question that I'm not seeing because I'm looking at multiple screens at this, at this moment, just do so. And how long will each of these two undertakings last? So, uh, we're, or three, we're talking about the background check, the informal uh, let's judgment care that we talked about earlier and the legal and financial due diligence. Now, in terms of time, the background check can take a few days to a week. It's very quick. And it's uh, usually within uh, five to 10, 15, 20 pages at, at worst. The um, informal questioning, as we saw before, can start early and should start early, to be honest, and can end late or even never end. It's just a good practice to have. So does it require you to be on site? No, but it would definitely benefit you uh, to have direct collection of information as a common practice. What about legal and financial due diligence? It will take from a few weeks, depending if a lot of material is already available or sent to you in physical and physical um, format or an online format, and they have no premise uh, that is worthwhile checking because it's just not relevant to the investment, et cetera, et cetera. But it also can go down to uh, or up to several months of work with online and offline work, including uh, legal expertise for the compliance of the contracts, as we saw earlier, and the, 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 the correctness of the information, the licenses and whatnot. But if the DD entails, as I annotated here, considerable on-site work, it will become critical. Now, you might be asking, I am about to do this DD with a company that I want to work with, but I am with my colleagues stranded, or let's say unable to easily access China. How do I do this? You would still need a professional firm to support you, but and they would do their part on, in China, obviously, but then you can still keep interrogating or talking or keeping the partner uh, on the ball, as we say, and keep him aware that, you know, this has to follow through. You're away for some time, but it doesn't mean that you're letting it go and you want to uh, continue um, keeping his attention also high and his cooperation close. And we have come now to the chapter in which we will discuss the records in China. The business license, the rubber stamps and permits and other licenses. So China has a long tradition. I might have already indicated of this earlier today. A long tradition over authenticating documents and red tape. These two combined, they never played in, in favor of each other or in favor of simplifying or simplification for foreign investors. But now that China ranks number 31 in the World Bank's in the World Bank classification for ease of doing business in, in the world, the country, China, is seriously improving. Improving what? The accessibility and documents complexity. So when I first joined uh, my firm in 2014, there were several changes going on, free trade zone, pilot zone, the, the, the removal of the minimum capital requirement, and, and, and many other 
um, many other improvements. And these were at an incredible pace. And when I talked to people who were in the firm for much longer than me, they saw that changes were ever bigger every second year. So we can expect this to improve and only to improve, but we have to remain vigilant also because there are language barriers. And all documents are written in Chinese, of course, and that's the valid language. So you cannot, um, you cannot use that uh, for your legal purposes, let's say. And rubber stamps, which, are, which we also called chops, which have an extremely old tradition, and they never cease to surprise and catch companies off guard all the time. We will see this in a few minutes. The business license. I was discussing about the business license in Germany yesterday, just yesterday with uh, our CPA here, um, because I founded the company here in Germany in late January, a GmbH, and I found it a very interesting experience because after years of helping foreign investors do the same in China, I can now see it from the German perspective or just the European perspective. And going back to the topic, I, I inquired whether we have in Germany a pretty business license. And the CPA said, unfortunately, we don't. We don't have that beautiful stamp or the colors or um, all the, the, the beautiful graphics. And especially, it doesn't come in two wonderful big formats. One A3, which is the scanned version that you see here, and the A4. Usually, this one that you see is kept in a safe, and the other one should be exposed uh, or um, uh, shown in uh, the premises, uh, in the factory or the shop or the office. So I'll navigate you quickly through the, the Chinese text here. You can help yourself with the left and right descriptions. So for our purpose today, the important ones will be the registration number up there. It will be also the business scope and definitely the QR code and the registered capital. So these are elements that are vital to the business license. All the others are as well because they define a lot of vital information of this, let's say, passport of the company. And it is important to have the partners send you this regularly because it might have been changed. Maybe the location changed, which is least interesting. Maybe the legal representative has changed or they have increased the capital or maybe they renewed the business scope, most importantly. So they might be doing more or something different than what you had expected or heard earlier. You have to stay on top of the corporate changes of the partner, whether by having somebody that reads Chinese perfectly and reading the business license, check what they send you or keep doing regular background checks every year or two. Now, it depends on really what you want and what you want to take away from the business relationship and what is important for your investment at this point. Let's move on to chops or rubber stamps. Uh, every year, uh, there is at least one article following one or more grand stories of how rubber stamps or chops in China have been misused and therefore underline again and again how powerful they are in how insignificant and how insignificant the signature that we use is and this doesn't touch small businesses only and sometimes the small businesses are even more careful than multinationals who are also domestic companies in china subject to the misuse and the consequences of not properly using rubber stamps so this is very important to understand whether you are as I said before, after you use the tree that would navigate you in the possible options out there for doing business with and in China, whether you are doing business with your own company, then you have your own chops, or whether you are receiving invoices or contracts or any other document that has or should have a chopped or rubber stamped document from a partner. Let me tell you a little bit better what I want to explain. What you see here, and this is... Um, some play, these are chops that belong to artists. Uh, they might even be, because of their shape, re vaguely remind, reminding of the legal representative ch uh, chop. But in my experience, I can tell you that the characters you see here are ancient Chinese. So usually they would be affixed on calligraphy, on artwork, or just on any on, on artistic, uh, artistic works. 
So if a company sends you a document with one of these type of chops saying that it is a company chop or it's even their, uh, uh, say the um, um, contract chop, you might give it a second thought. Let's go into modern times. Uh, these three type of chops represent, I can tell you straight away, a Hong Kong company or a mainland company, but without any of the characteristics of a traditional chop that is bound, uh, is legally um, of significance for doing business in China. So how does this chop ha have to be? It has to be of a specific shape, obviously. It has to be done by a particular company that carves the chop and his, is for this reason appointed by the government in each province, in each big city. And there's, you, can, you can run physical checks of these chops. Where? At the PSB, the famous Public Security Bureau or also the police. And they would be able to um, receive your complaint, navigate you through the process of verification of this CHOPS authenticity, and even maybe give you indications on where on which website or which office to go to, to analyze based on their digital archives, whether a CHOP corresponds or not to the one that you think that is fraudulent. Now, uh, just one more thing I would like to emphasize. So uh, these chops are given to a company during the process of incorporation and right after you or the company receives the business license. So there has to be a high level of attention between of uh, your colleague who speaks Chinese or yourself if you're fluent in Chinese and see whether the, the name of the company that is on the invoices, that is on um, products or materials or contracts is the same that you will find on the rubber stamps. And this is a typical domestic company rubber stamp with a star. The chops types. So it is good practice, really good practice to ask and repeatedly ask different people if possible in uh, your partner's uh, company, how the usage of the chop is in their company. Is it how, it, how do they record or technically speaking, how do they log the use of, this, of, of the chops? meaning whether they have an internal controls procedure to guarantee that there is a tight control over who can affix or stamp and what kind of document they are using this chop for and which rubber stamp is used particularly for that, um, that, that uh, occasion. And if these actions are duly recorded in a logbook. Yes, we're going back into offline time from very digital country to a very offline practice. So please remember that the only valid signature is the one of the legal representative. I'm talking about signature, not stamping. Best if this one is accompanied by its own rubber stamp to validate questionable choppings to say. Now I'm getting excited because there are so many nightmare stories connected to the misuse of the chops. And if you want to hear more, I can tell you a little bit more. Um, but just keep in mind that I can give you a practical example that the best practice and you can verify this with your partner if it is significantly uh, important for you. The best practice to use and log the use of a chop is to have them all in a safe, whether at your premises, the partner's premises, or at the professional service firm premises, under in a specific box with a number, with a label, and then a logbook where you or the partner would chop every time a contract or a document with that specific chop and uh, indicating who did that at what, on what day, for what purpose, and then always scan and send to the relevant competent person that has previously authorized this, of course, the document that has been chopped. So this is a very sound usage, or uh, let's say a um, logging procedure of the usage of the chops. So you can definitely understand and have an intuition that if you lose a chop, it is extremely difficult to replace it. It's not impossible. It is very tedious. You have to choose, and this is a proper fork in the road, whether to denounce this to the police, which could be a long process. It could stop you from going directly to the other option, which is to resort to the court, which is a, a different path, and it gives you a different outcome, but both are eminently blocking your business. 
Now think about the, 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 car, the following scenario. You have a representative office and you want to shut it down and you have just one more employee and you are, let's say, done with China or you want to move to another province altogether in China. And the only thing you need to end the deregistration procedure of the office is the chop. The person that is in China, while well, you are not, doesn't respond to the emails, WeChat, calls, personal email, and is not to be found in the office. And there's a big fat lock sealing the office doors together. This is a big sign of trouble because the person may have understood that you're shutting down the business and they don't want to, or maybe it's not time for them and they want to sort of show you what the rules are in China at that moment. So there's a lot of negotiation between parties informally first. If these don't work, then you can use a lawyer letter. If that doesn't work, then you have sufficient evidence to resort either to the court or to the to the police, the PSP. There are certain forms and uh, to fill out to get a replacement for a chop, but also you have to announce this on digital and uh, on, on offline papers. It is a long, tedious and painful and costly process. So if you are running the business, keep the chops with you. If you're not running the business, keep the high alert on whether these chops are the authentic ones and whether the person using it, this is very important, is authorized to use it on the documents that are going to be used in relation with you in your business. <clears throat> Sorry for the water break. We mentioned the unified social credit code a moment ago. How is it composed? So another tool to verify the authenticity or the correspondence of the information that we hope that you keep collecting, we hope you keep collecting, I said it twice, is the unified social credit code. And it's made of 18 digits. Under the following criteria, you can understand these digits and what they represent. So the first one represents the registering authority and it is usually always the SAMR. And I'll quickly tell you what the SAMR is. Uh, I have done so before, but I'll tell you what kind of other bureaus it includes. The second digit represents the registered entity type. I said before, whether a wholly foreign owned entity, JV, rep office, a state owned enterprise, if it's a private entity, or even an individually owned company. The digits from three through eight represent the location not, not to say anything here, from 9 to 17, they represent the organizational code. And this we have also in other countries, right? That represent the industry and the sub-industry and whatnot. The last digit represents uh, a check digit. And this is, uh, can be either a letter or a number that the SAMR will keep, um, will, will, will check for an additional layer, layer of security. So I was saying earlier, the SAMR for who has been dealing with China um, previously and suddenly doesn't see SAIC in written anywhere anymore. These, this, um, um, in 2018, in the summer of 2018, we went through a sweeping uh, change in the administration. And the SAMR consolidates in one ministry, many functions and bodies. So the market regulation function, previously shared by three separate, separate ministries, the AQSIQ, also gone, which was the administration for quality supervision, inspection, and quarantine, which I was happy to unlearn. <laughs> the China Food and Drug Administration, which now is the SDA, not the FDA. And the State Administration of Industry and Commerce. That is, I've already repeated that four times. I think you're, you, you memorized this. Just to know what the SAMR is, if you see it appear on documents. So why am I bringing up so many uh, images of licenses? Uh, am I trying to uh, persuade you that I have seen these before? Yes, but also in the context of today's webinar, and I hope that you will appreciate this, when you are checking informally or, in, or formally, we saw how, right, formally, whether the partner has actually the grant from the country, from the authorities to execute a specific business. 
So let's look at these, for example. There's a couple of slides about them, so you can lay back and listen. So it is common to require further licenses. This is what I have annotated in a specific and let's say certificate heavy industry. For example, take, take liquor. To sell wine in China or heavy liquor, liquor uh, you need to apply for one or more licenses. And these usually also entail that the company, in this case, I wrote a wholly foreign owned enterprise, but it could be a domestic one, uh, applies and obtains a food or business operation license. And this is uh, obtained, as, I, as you know, after you get the business license, obviously. Uh, the alcohol distribution certificate is another one you might want to see if you are selling beer or um, other alcoholic beverages like wine from Europe or elsewhere. Because if the partner doesn't have this, he might still purchase, he might still try to sell, but maybe through a partner firm that also says they have this license, but also maybe is relying on a third party. So it looks like the Wild West but there are many companies in China that are meaning well, they operate well, well beyond and above uh, scrutiny. But sometimes it is just good practice to take a look at these licenses and, and see whether when you're engaging with a partner to the sale or distribution or even importation towards this direction, so Europe, a specific good, they are actually authorized. What can you... What can be prevented if you do this minimum check? Delays, fines, and the actual conclusion of the, of, the, of, the, of the deal. So a couple of steps ahead always pays off. Let's see the next a couple of uh, certificates or licenses. Uh, we've seen the alcohol one before, but sanitary li certificate is important uh, also when you're dealing with a particular industry where there's a lot of handling of food and beverage or handling of patients let's, uh, or, or people who need uh, medical support because every employee of the company that you are going to work with or that you will found, you will establish, for that particular job will need a sanitary certificate to handle, as I said before, those situations. Now, if you don't have that or you take it too casually or you just accept the promise of your partner in having done so, and then there's a there's a check of the authorities on whether you have these sanitary certificates. It's a uh, quite big trouble. And every time I say quite big trouble, uh, please record it because we'll talk later about the record of the corporate social credit system, which is recording all the time, all of these small or what you think you may think are smaller um, breaches. Now, quickly, talking about permits and licenses, we'll do this later too, but it is uh, important if you want to take note or if you want to keep it in a, in a checkbox. I know that the EU SME Center does a great job in providing these checkbox boxes. Always ask for the, import, the importer or the exporter to provide the import-export license. Uh, there's no shame in doing so. You just want to make sure that who you're handling with has at least an up-to-date or a current license. Uh, same, same goes for the distribution. So some products may require a special distribution license. And this uh, I've covered in a few slides earlier for food, but also for delivery of services. And this, and I would like to give an example. So I understand that some of you are in uh, several um, businesses that may have nothing to do with one another, but some of them stood out for coming from the healthcare industry. Now, the new digitization of healthcare today brings software and know-how to patients that are on the other side of the world, especially in diagnosing from abroad. What is the problem here is that if you come to China as a foreign enterprise and you want to suddenly apply the same way you do it in, let's say, in the US or in Belgium uh, to analyze the well-being of patients, whether it's mental, whether it's the pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals they're taking or they're under a lot of uh, procedures over time and you want to support them, this may not qualify for a business that you can run by yourself in China. So the example is of this company that has an app that will monitor your well-being, as I said before, and will process it 
and give you suggestions from time to time on how to monitor and improve your well-being through over-the-counter medicine, fitness, or uh, better nourishment. At the beginning, on the outset of this project, the client thought that they could do it, plug and play, just copy paste. But the reality is, is that the service, uh, the partner is the Chinese partner or the domestic company is the one that actually can have that type of license. So long short, if you want to access a specific service industry, even though you're not talking about hard goods or chemicals or something that obviously requires a license, it might still be very meaningful to check whether you need to outsource this to a domestic company. To end my example, the client had to, and they were happy to, so they didn't have to deal with the license mess, outsource this to a local provider, and then they would consolidate the information. In brackets, mindfulness about the issue that all data, personal data in China now is more and more um, taken into consideration. So that where you store this information is extremely important as well. Let's go on because maybe this is not a sector that is relevant for everybody today. If they're a manufacturer or a supplier, your partner, um, you need to get the environmental impact assessment reports. These uh, don't last forever. They are connected to the way they use the soil, the way the infrastructure is deployed on the ground, the way they use um, their, um, um, their, their in, as I said this already, the infrastructure to cater to the specific use um, that they will put it to. For example, if your business partner says that they can analyze specific products and they need to do this by uh, vibrations, um, any kind of, uh, let's say, um, uh, hard hard uh, analysis or hard uh, trial on the goods and this will create waste etc if they don't have an environmental impact assessment report that can can assure that they're using the best minimum practice or the best practice to get rid of the waste to uh, <clears throat> reduce the fumes or the gas emissions this has uh, been a problem because it will also fall on you and this is another reminder to keep in mind for the cscs later as a uh, partner in the business that is not qualified to do what they do. Other records that are very important, as I stressed earlier in the formal due diligence slides, to understand and have other people understand for you if you're not qualified, is our registered capital, the credit history, and financials. So we, we talked about this briefly earlier. <clears throat> the registered capital is verifies or tells you if the company is adequately supported financially to run the type of business they say they can, because it can either be a fake company or a shell company or a paper tiger company, as we saw before, with minimum, minimum um, assets or funds. And as soon as you start engaging with them, even if they're well-intentioned, they will run out of cash and run out of, running out of cash uh, is a, is a big red flag. So careful about the registered capital and ask if the partner has intentions of raising more capital and, and when. A credit history check can always be asked or obtained at the P, uh, at the People's Republic, uh, yeah, People's Bank of China, the BOC, I wanted to say, and they will issue a credit reference uh, at, their, at their center. Financial records are also quite important, um, but as I said before, some of them may not be available after 2014-13. I'm checking the time and I'm getting closer to the, to the one hour mark, if not exceeding it, but I would be um, not doing you a favor if I just go extremely fast. I will accelerate though, maybe in maybe dealing with land use rights is not every day's concern for you when talking to potential partners but if you're dealing with a partner that has to do something on a particular property please tell them that uh, you need to see the property ownership certificate and this is what it looks like now quickly into corporate social credit system i will uh, use 10 more minutes before the uh, the, the break i suppose You've all heard about the China social credit system that uh, became a, a big scandal. It's like the big brother 
that uh, was checking. So China was going to check everybody's behavior and with cameras and with uh, uh, probably hacking your day-to-day -day activities. But the actual goal, as manifesto as it may sound, is to promote the traditional value of integrity. And this is the, the, the way the Chinese government puts it. It is fully operational since the end of last year. And every individual, as well as a company, gets a score. So this is a big change in China's compliance. You can tell because we went from a blunt restriction of accessing the Chinese market for foreign investors to a sophisticated influence on market participation of all companies. This means that, yes, you can participate, but you will have a lot of scrutiny, and this is how we're going to do it, and not only at your detriment. So in the past, it's nothing new, but in the past, many centers, or let's say data islands, such as courts or the, the regulators, the financial bodies, uh, governments, ministries, or customs, they all had their information about companies, but there was no master data. And this master data includes all of the other information that we discussed in the background check. So this is nothing new. I'll go through it a little bit faster, uh, including also the IP data. So what patents or, or trademarks are filed or have not been renewed, et cetera. And then also the financial data, data that is connected to production or mal, mal uh, practice in the production, some competition issues, or maybe some uh, breach of environment assessment, environment rules and research and development, etc. So all of this information is in the master uh, data board. And you using, now that you know the Unify social credit number, what it is, you can enter this in the National Enterprise Credit Information System and see by checking the blacklist button if that company is or not blacklisted. You can also see if they have been, uh, um, if something um, went off, or let's say a red flag is there under a random inspection result. Uh, also, there could be a, a suspicion of fraudulent use of others' identity and registration, which can be recorded by the CSCS. So this is a very um, important thing to see when you're checking the behavior uh, of a company that can become your partner. So yes, there's a blacklist, but there's also a red list. So th the blacklist has been there for ages, at least uh, more than seven years. So there's no new offenses listed. There's just more layers of enforcement. Uh, this blacklist is targeting companies and organizations and the inv individuals in the person of the legal representative and every government entity has its own. What is the red list? It's basically as if it were the, we the, the, the green list for us, let's say, because red in Chinese is positive, actually. This, this is it pos it's possible to get more exposure to the red list if you maintain harmonious labor relations, if you're always paying your taxes on time, you have no problems with the arbitration, so labor arbitration, etc. But uh, you should not, you should avoid blacklists rather than chase red lists, okay? So if you're very good in avoiding the blacklist behavior, then you will probably benefit immediately with red list, uh, um, let's say, premiums or awards. So what, ab what about this, Ricardo? Why are you telling me all of this? I will, I will be happy to tell you why, because even if you're not in China, and you're dealing with companies that are in China, whether foreign or local, you may find that if you, these companies are engaging in all pra in practices that are triggering a lot of uh, red flags and putting them in blacklists, even your business with them will be influenced. And therefore, you might be falling within the attention of the authorities. Now, there's a five-minute break, and then I'll wrap it up with uh, a couple of chapters really fast. We'll see you back in five.
And we're back. I hope you had a good coffee or poured yourself another one. I have to excuse my, um, my previous uh, um, part of the presentation. We're running 10 minutes behind. So please expect the session, the whole session, including Jim's and the Q&A to, um, to spill over 15 minutes the intended time. So 12.15. Thank you in advance. I will proceed now if there's no further technical issue or requirement. Good, all confirmed. So when, when you're dealing with a partner, as I said before, on a, a manufacturing basis or they are the, your supplier and you are able to visit, unlike right now, the country, uh, visiting the partner's premises and assets is, uh, no, there's nothing like that. You will understand so much uh, in, uh, in a fraction of the time and especially much more if you're accompanied by uh, experts of your own team or external experts. So let's talk about this a, a second. Um, we have some examples from our work and I would be happy to uh, discuss some of them with you and see if they resonate with you or they can uh, give you answers that you can adapt to your specific uh, situation. So it is essential that you ensure that your expectations uh, are uh, your expectations on workflow and the organization of process uh, at the company. So what is uh, their day-to-day -day or quarter-to-quarter -quarter procedures? Uh, is there a quality control inspection? If so, of what kind? Does it meet your requirements? Is it clean enough? Do the do the employees work in conditions that your company also supports, or do they have good company values? Uh, appliances and safety and machinery, are these at the standard that you require or that you would be able to accept? What about the warehouse? Is it covered enough? Is it uh, uh, in reach of uh, access points to logistics? Does it meet your requirements for either cold uh, storage or room temperature or against any uh, particular security or safety measure that you may, may need? So I would like to discuss um, at least two or three issues here. Um, examples, I want to say, we had a, a FMB client that uh, was, we, we still have this client that is trying, was trying to uh, create a specific, specific kind of snack, but this snack required uh, a machine that had an open flame. And this type of machine was stored in a place that the premise didn't um, qualify for open flames, although the the flame was relatively small, basically just like a kitchen utensil. So the local authorities, they came by and they checked and they uh, said that the company didn't have any permits. So they had to stop everything they were uh, doing, putting in place and actually apply for that permit. Funny enough, in uh, uh, same, a very similar case in a neighboring province, this is absolutely no pro problem at all. This may not be of news to people who are actually doing already business with China, but to those who consider the Chinese government to apply all rules at the same way in every province, it is uh, probably a disappointment or uh, just uh, an eyebrow raiser. So, riser. so uh, other, another case uh, is where I've seen personally, there were workers that were sitting on stools with no gloves and assembling very sharp edge objects. And uh, you know, for some people, this may be okay. For some others, it may raise a, a employee's working conditions concern and you might not want to keep working with that partner or maybe you want to help him, encourage him to adopt better, better measures. There's another case uh, that um, uh, where I got a lot of information from locally on site, which is a flooring factory company, great place, very organized, but the tension was extremely palpable. And then the investor decided rightfully not to keep investing. So other issues that are very important to keep in mind is that if the partner's moving too fast, you should, probably raise another red flag because an example that I can bring you is uh, a company that had no interaction with a Chinese, uh, that's an Italian company, no interaction with a Chinese um, partner in the uh, chemicals, um, in the chemicals um, varnish industry, inks, and they said that they had the proper machines, that they had the proper people. And the only time these uh, people met was on a webcam. And then the Chinese sent them a, a wonderfully written MOU, which is a memorandum of understanding. But basically they were shooting too high and they had not the minimum requirements. So the, that was the end of the, the potential partnership for the better. Another example would be a software company where the partner won't return original proof of training stubs and deny the access to premises. I was there for four hours 
probably more, and they would not let us go into the office building to collect these stubs, which, which would then in turn give the, the client the opportunity to be paid. Appropriate layout of the operations. Uh, so uh, you might have uh, problems with the layout uh, of the factory or the office premise, which is not ideal for your, uh, for your partnering or your work. Internal controls, values and company culture, unfortunately, I need to go a little bit faster. So you need to check uh, whether you understand or give some time to uh, business culture differences. So make sure that you can uh, uh, discuss this with your, your colleagues or even uh, the EO SME Center and see if they have uh, some materials that can introduce you to doing business with Chinese in a very Chinese way. I unfortunately need to go a little bit faster here. Internal controls is a tool that you can put in place when checking uh, above and beyond the background check and the due diligence on a company's way of working. And this entails how they think, how they organize, and how they cherish or see the value of segregating, separating functions into inside of their company. So a typical example is that sales and cash department should never be uh, overlapping with purchase or HR should not overlap with uh, um, with other internal control cycles or we call them spheres. So the, the more segregated, the better they are, definitely. If you see that there is a strong supervision by shareholders, this is a good sign. If the cash management is appropriately dealt with, also a great sign. If there's a poor inventory management, let's say, and uh, with just uh, paper stubs and no electronic records, and the costing center is also very casual, this is a bad sign. And we talked about the chop management uh, earlier. So what about uh, frequent do's and don'ts? Will you ever ask your potential partner, will you rip me off or disappear after I pay you to make sure that he won't cheat? No, you can't. But you can put in place some best practices to see whether the payments are actually um, can go through, whether the bank accounts are always consistent. And also the contact details. Do you know the strategic people to talk to? Do you have the numbers? Have you tried the numbers? Do you know that WeChat is more popular than the email, even doing business in China with your partners? And you can also fake some actions and see the reactions. You can say, we'll send a third party auditor and see what their reaction is, or you'll do a QC inspection. And if they fly, if they leave, then you have your answer. Fraud and fraud prevention, definitely uh, interesting, but I need to go a little bit faster. But how can you prevent fraud practices among other best practices? So you can, when you interact with the company that is new, you can simply search the web, um, foreign or Chinese, add the, nam the name of the company in English and scam and see what the results give you. There's an enormous advantage in doing so because most of the time the internet is quite right. You can surf also on online directories and e-commerce merchants directories, such as the big Alibaba or China made in China uh, or China made. Uh, and they, you will get a very anal analogous or similar information for your feedback. Uh, were they at a very established trade show? Yes or no? We saw the importance of this. Uh, contracts can be bilingual, but Chinese version prevails always. So keep an eye on well-written and well-translated contracts and have these repeatedly checked by both legal partners of the parties or the party's partners. Um, where to look for fraud in, turn, in their internal HR, in accounting and uh, collecting external feedback. And I'll uh, have to go a little bit faster here, excuse me. So there's a low chance of recovering payments when you get scammed. You have to just accept this. Uh, you have to report immediately to the PSB, the police, and if the amounts involved in the scam and the fraud are very high, and we can discuss what is high or not, you can resort to judicial recourse. But keep in mind that uh, court expenses, uh, especially lawyer fees for domestic law firms, et cetera, can be very, very high. So a typical example of a scam is the following. A European company sources construction materials or, let's say, uh, components for green tech. The... Chinese company sends the goods samples, and these are excellent. And therefore, the foreign company orders for a specific amount of items, and these are sent. In the meantime, just a fraction of the goods that are received are of the quality that the foreign company wanted. But meantime, the payment is already done, and the Chinese companies disappeared. This would have been avoided probably with some best practice of one of those, at least, that we discussed in the whole morning today. 
So what other best practices you can take away, I promise this is the last slide, are the following. And we can elaborate more on these, or maybe they're very straightforward for you. And in any case, you should always report to your local embassy or consulate. Do the next guy or company a favor and report it to the embassy of your country in China or the consulate with full details, especially to a specific commissioner that looks at investment into China. They will be very happy. They will thank you for that. And in severe cases, may even offer help. I have an example where uh, um, a European company was uh, doing business well with a Chinese company, but then uh, they were acquired and they started to eliminate, let's say, the foreign um, uh, participants to that, that manufacturing plant one by one in terms of participation, obviously. And they would, uh, they, the Italian consulate in that specific case offered and finally issued a letter from the consul. And this put the Chinese um, and the local Chinese government of that town uh, on their toes and they actually opened up and they were able to discard, to, to, to get back on the uh, dialogue. Speaking of dialogue, you should always uh, keep in mind that you're represented as a European with a European Commission delegation to China and Mongolia in Beijing, which are very helpful. They have several sec sectors and ex specialists that can help you and businesses to either lobby or understand or try to get the latest on a specific industry. Also check websites and email fraud. This uh, is a typical of a time where we are traveling less. And this doesn't mean that be just because you have emails and you have apparently certification uh, methods online that can guarantee that an email is or not authentic, it doesn't mean that it's not a scam. So a good practice is to check with your IT, system, IT team or if you're IT savvy, check for yourself. Verify if the website with which you're dealing with has an ICP number and a China government logo at the bottom of it. And it comes from a proper URL, a proper um, website address. And also the email address or domain names should be other than private domain names in most cases. Uh, also be careful if the site is only in English and uh, or it doesn't work in many cases. But this is, we have to leave this to, uh, to another moment for discussion. Laura, Gwen, I have uh, tried to stay within the 20 minute mark after the um, after the coffee break, if not less, to be able to give the floor to Jim. Sorry, Jim, for keeping you waiting, uh, but I am sure that the audience is happy to, to listen to yours, which is extremely exciting part of doing business with China and with Chinese partners. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. Uh, and I hope that everyone can, uh, can see my presentation and can hear me loud and, uh, loud and clear. Yes, Jim. All good. Thanks for this, uh, this fascinating uh, presentation, Ricardo. I'll uh, take a few minutes um, to give you a bit of a pointer on intellectual property and specifically the services of the China IP SME Help Desk. Um, I also want to use this opportunity to thank uh, the EU SME Center and uh, the Flanders Chamber of, uh, Flanders Chinese Chamber of Commerce um, for this event. They're yeah, amongst our most loyal uh, partners in disseminating information about IP and Thank you as ever for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, to spread the message about IP and the importance of IP, especially for European small and medium enterprises. Uh, my name is Jim Stoltman. I'm the project manager for the China IP SME Help Desk uh, based in Brussels, responsible for outreach um, in all of the member states. We also have a team based in China in Beijing at the European Chamber, who is responsible for uh, all of our activities in uh, China, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan. Maybe to start, why intellectual property? Um, IP is simply one of your key business assets. And the hard fact, the harsh fact is that only 10% of European SMEs actually use IP um, to protect their intangible assets. So that's only 10% of European SMEs use IP to protect their intangible assets through trademarks, patents, um, utility models, um, so there's a huge amount of SMEs that don't use IP and especially um, in dealing with countries like China, not having your rights registered um, is very risky and, and something we strongly discourage. Um, and we 
yeah, we're fully convinced that it's incredibly important to be well prepared in terms of intellectual property before you start doing your business in China. And Ricardo mentioned before a lot of interesting pointers and best practices regarding due diligence and checking and sort of verifying your partners. Um, and I suppose intellectual property is an integral part of that, um, not only looking at the IP portfolios of your potential partners, but also preparing yourself in terms of intellectual property by registering your trademarks, registering your patents, um, and putting certain measures in place um, with regards to trade secrets, for example. A bit more on that later. Um, IP is incredibly useful to um, yeah, sort of set yourself apart from your competitors as well. It gives you exclusive rights um, over your invention um, or your brand, for example. It's an incredibly effective way as well to attract investment. If you can show to a potential investor or a partner that you have a, a IP portfolio that covers IP rights in the United States, in Europe, in China, in Indonesia, in, in key third markets, it's a very good way to set yourself apart and to also showcase potential investors and partners that you're serious about your business and that you're well prepared um, to do business in third countries. It gives you also increased control and decreased risk when outsourcing. So by, for example, producing part of your product in China uh, and outsourcing it that for, uh, for cost reasons, um, having your rights registered there gives you more control over what is done with your invention and with your products there and gives you also a means to go to court in case there's uh, potentially an infringement of your IP rights. Our key message with regards to intellectual property is really to prepare and adapt yourself. Register your IP. I mentioned it before. There is no such thing as automatic protection. There's too many times that we see SMEs from Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, that assume that having their rights registered in their home countries, that they're automatically protected in a market such as China. This is not the case. You have to register your rights in the markets uh, that you do business. This goes for China, but also for other markets, for the US, for Singapore, for Vietnam, uh, for Brazil. Uh, it's incredibly important to be aware of this. So make sure that your rights are registered in the markets that, in which you're doing business. As I mentioned before, it's important to build a bundle of IP rights. Don't just focus on one single right. Uh, don't just register your trademark, although it's obviously very important, but try to build, build a wider portfolio of IP rights that covers uh, patents, utility models, um, copyrights, uh, trademarks, and also put in place measures to protect your trade secrets, which uh, have become increasingly important in the context of China as well. Um, adapt to Chinese specificities. Language is obviously a, a barrier in China, and we strongly recommend um, entities to work together with, with qualified law firms that know the Chinese market, know the Chinese legal system, and who can help you registering your rights there. Um, negotiate contracts. I think uh, Ricardo alluded to this before as well. Contracts are obviously incredibly important. Um, they're there for times in which uh, things um, go south. So it's incredibly important to have everything set in place and include IP clauses in your contracts, whether it's um, an R&D partner, um, one of your employees, uh, a distributor, um, or maybe someone who delivers or produces parts of your, your product, IP needs to be in the contracts and it needs to be clearly stipulated what can be done with your product and by who. And as I mentioned before, do not forget the trade secrets. So this is really in a nutshell, some key pointers. Um, we've obviously done many trainings with uh, EU SME Center and Flanders Chamber of Commerce uh, before where we delve into a bit more detail, but this is just to, uh, to make you aware. Um, the China IP SME Help Desk, what we can do for you is um, we can offer you free of charge first line confidential assistance on IP protection management and enforcement in China. So if you have any questions regarding IP in China, uh, please feel free to contact us. Um, it's important here to mention that we do not replace law firms, but we can give you sort of initial advice to set you on the right path towards protecting your intangible assets in the Chinese market. And as mentioned before, it's free of charge. Um, 
who are the potential beneficiaries of our services? These are EU SMEs and SMEs from associated countries. Uh, you can think here of a number of countries, for example, in the, in the Balkans. Um, Turkey also uh, is covered under our uh, service offerings. And we work with country, companies that are entirely based in Europe and are sort of vaguely thinking of entering the Chinese market and want to have some initial uh, information. We work with companies that already have a, a presence in China uh, and with companies or entrepreneurs that are seeking um, commercial or R&D activities in China. In short summary, um, the free services that we offer uh, include an inquiry helpline. This is a, a phone number and a physical email address that uh, companies can write to with any question they have. There is no simple question. There's no complex question. Don't hesitate. You'll receive a response within three working days. We do training workshops similar to the one that was carried out today, very much uh, focused on IP. Um, webinars as well. Um, we have a website, recently a new website. Um, we've been included in the Europa European Commission um, web environment. Um, I'll share a link in the chat box um, to this, this new website where you can find a huge repository of free information um, on IP in Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, Macau, on various industries uh, and on various topics of pertinence to, uh, to intellectual property. Just a few examples of, um, of the guides that we, um, that we, sorry, I think a few examples of some of the materials that we have, um, an IP fact sheet on mainland China, uh, an infographic on how to protect your trade secrets, uh, but we have many, many more uh, information available on um, our website. I mentioned this before, questions, it's free of charge, it's fully confidential. Don't hesitate to write us on this email address, question at china-iprhelpdesk.eu. And we've got an expert panel present in Beijing, in China, um, to help you with any of the questions you might have. This could be a question on costs. How much does it cost to register a trademark in China? Two more complicated questions on technology transfer or contracts, for example. And we'd be happy to assist you and put you in the right direction um, with regards to your IP protection and enforcement in China. Stay connected. Um, we're present on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and um, yeah, you'll receive updates there on uh, IP legislation and interesting events and trainings. Last but not least, before we go to the Q&A session, um, we've seen there's some quite a number of questions already um, being shared. Um, this IP help desk doesn't only exist for China. There's also IP SME help desks for other countries, for India, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and also for Europe, where IP issues in the European context. And all of them offer the same services. And we strongly encourage you to make use of those free services um, and of those European funded projects for your own benefit and information. So don't hesitate. We're there to help and uh, put you on the right path with regards to your assets. Um, and I think now I'll give the floor back to, um, to Gwen or Laura uh, for the Q&A uh, session of, um, of today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim, for your very interesting presentation and also the very good service that, that the IP Help Desk offers. I would now like to go to the questions so first question, is the filing of financial data mandatory in the SAMR? I think this is a question for Ricardo. Yeah, here, uh, I'm back and on camera. So I saw this question, uh, is the financial, is the filing or financial uh, glasses uh, mandatory in the SAMR? As I said before, the SAMR has replaced the AIC for all of uh, its functions. Now, the point here is that we're discussing about uh, talking to potential client, uh, partners, right? So because audit reports and the financial statements are usually rarely shared at the initial state of, uh, stage of a conversation because it's, it's uh, sensitive information and it's revealing, et cetera. Um, it, this can be requested, however, uh, as, this, as the situation allows it or obtained directly through the SAMR. 
So after 2014, however, as I tried, I alluded to, uh, probably the question is uh, came before I alluded to it. However, uh, the annual inspection became, or the, the, the obligation to file the annual inspection or to receive an annual inspection became annual report. So this means that the SAMR is leaving it now up to the companies to, uh, uh, to perform its own annual inspection and then upload what is supposed to be a lawful and authentic uh, report. So in, uh, that's why when people ask for a background check on years that go be before 2000, um, uh, 2018 or 17 or even 14, there might not be all the financial data available. And that's when it's also a fork in the road. You might want, you might want to consider, should I call this potential partner and ask him for this uh, information and, and how will he react? Or am I okay with just a couple of years of information of these uh, financials? It is it is a bit a bit tricky, but uh, if this can if this can um, if this can help or, or this can give it a little bit more information, publicly listed company have a, of course a requirement to file every year. Okay, thank you. So let's go to the next question. To check the validity of the jobs uh, with the Public Security Bureau, do you need to hire a lawyer or, or so, or everyone can do it? So this is a uh, one of those. <laughs> Uh, situations where it's more exciting, right? Because you have to do, you have, you're dealing with uh, with um, with chops that are being stolen or being uh, uh, forged, let's say. So, if a chop is already registered by the by the PSB, as it is, it is possible to check without a lawyer, and this could be done uh, at a qualified chop carving shop, as we call them, in any top city, tier one or tier two city. Uh, depends on other cities we can check for the person asking the question uh, but and this is probably i hope this is answering the question specifically if uh, you are me if you mean of a person holding a fake chop and you want to make sure that this chop is real authentic this may be complicated yes and i've seen this happening in at least two cases in the last seven or eight years so in 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 short the police the psb the whole PSB uh, bureau will not allow anybody to verify it. So unless, and this is the big unless, there is a criminal case ongoing or a litigation case filed already. And in this case, yes, a lawyer with a POA obviously uh, needs to be involved. The case that I was talking to um, talking about earlier had both. It had first uh, um, uh, a criminal case and then uh, obviously litigation, and then obviously the access was was granted through a lawyer. So I'd say, uh, in short, you can check without a lawyer uh, if there's a, already a shop registered. Let's say that you want to 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 verify the information that the partner gave you and see if it's true that they have applied for a shop. You can go without a lawyer to the PSP. But if you are holding uh, a malicious shop. Uh, you need those two conditions to be able to get access and be granted access by the PSP. Okay, thank you. Another question about the chops. So some company oh. chops, including bilingual ones, may or may not include the social credit code below the red star in the middle. What is the difference? Mm. Well, uh, so com some company chops will never have the social credit system number because they just are not for that purpose. Um, it's just imagine the company, the uh, bank account information shop, or the legal representative shop, or even a contract domestic shop, or like a uh, sorry, um, a domestic company contract shop, or even your Woofies contract shop. This may have bilingual the star and no credits, uh, credit uh, unified code. It doesn't mean that it won't be, uh, it won't appear on another one. For example, the company shop bilingual version. Uh, can have the number. And in some cases, it can all, you can also apply for the star. Uh, I've uh, heard about this, but it's not necessarily uh, required. So company chop, contract chop, FAPIAL chop, uh, customs, import, uh, you know, the bank um, information and legal representative chops, they all have the different shapes and requirements, but they also have some optionals, especially now that there is increasing demand on, on uh, having specific type of card chops with uh, specific information on them. Okay, thank you. 
I see no other questions, so I think we, uh, we can end here now. So I would like to thank Mr. Ricardo Benusa and Mr. Jim Stokeman for their very interesting presentation on knowing Pleasure. your Chinese partner. We really learned a lot. I also thank Laura for the very good organization and congratulations also to the USME Center for the great work and the studies and reports they do. So I also like to end with some advice for being successful. Some things have been said. Knowing your Chinese partner, I think we learned a lot today, as I said. Build your IP strategy, think long-term, long be persistent, decide fast, be open-minded, keep being informed, and also do your homework, take enough advice from experts, trade commissioners, and chambers, and USME Center, and of course, build up your relationships. We also warmly welcome you to our next webinar organized by the Flanders China Chamber of Commerce and the EU China Business Association on China for China, what's the shape of things to come for European business in China. This will be organized on June 1st at 9 a.m. So you can look at our website at www.flanderschina.be. Thank you very much. And you will all receive the PPT and the video. It will also be on YouTube. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for all the participants before leaving. Uh, when you close this window, you will be receiving an invitation to fill up the survey. We would appreciate if you take a few minutes to fill it up because uh, it gives us precious information on things that we can continue designing for your interest. So please uh, take these few times and, and let us know what you thought about this event and what other events you would like to us to, to design for you. Thank Laura, you very much. Can yeah. I have one one quick uh, issue um, yes, because of please. the chops uh, the chops question that I received? Mm. I already replied with a little bit more details to this, but if anybody listening still is interested in that question about the star and the number, um, what I can add is that. The number on the chop that you may be talking about, and we can discuss this on email, is not the social credit code. It is the registration number for that chop in the Public Security Bureau mm. and up and until 2011. So maybe this is a company that has obtained the chop before that year uh, and does not have the code there. So uh, secondly, the chop of the domestic company has the star in the middle, as I said before. Okay. In any case, I will be sharing with you the questions so that you yes, can wonderful. review them if you want. Okay, and then Good. we can send them back from the USME Center to the participants. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for uh, your support today, Ricardo. Thank you to the China Thank you for USME Help Desk. Organizing. Yes. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Ricardo. Thank and you. see you all next time. Have a great day. You too. Bye. 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 Bye, Jim. Bye.